Welcome to this narrated PowerPoint on crime and punishment. So crime and punishment makes up half of paper one, the first half of paper one, in fact. Paper's now in 45 minutes. Second half of it is the Elizabethans. And crime and punishment is divided itself into four sections. You can see at the top here, 1250 to 1500, so that's the medieval section. Then we have the early modern period, the industrial period, and the modern era. The paper starts off with some simple uh, simple knowledge questions, content questions, just one word answers are doing fine for them. And then it's really, really important that you plan your answers. Question two, write a clear and organized summary. It must be paragraphed, it must be planned first. You need to think about what it is and you need to plan the different concepts you're going to cover. Question three, what caused the increase of crime is the example given here. Uh, again, you need to plan that question, plan your answer, make sure you are considering different factors. And second order content, again, that just means complexity. You're thinking about how it changed over time, prioritizing those different issues or linking those different issues together or thinking about how it affected different aspects of society. And then we have an essay question here at the bottom. The major points are one here. So again, pick which question you're gonna do very carefully. Again, plan your answer and same sort of thing. We're gonna look for a very short introduction, giving you a direction, a paragraph agreeing, or given one factor, a second paragraph, and then a sophisticated conclusion we're looking for, showing us it's not as simple as yes or no, or this or that. Don't forget to help you with this. We have the chronology game, um, which you all have access to, and that, that's not a bad game to be playing and considering the change between the different periods. So first of all, let's have a look at medieval crime and punishment. Now, this first section of each of the different areas is important because it gives you the structure for which society sees itself. And very much for medieval period, we're looking at this idea of hierarchy. So we have the king at the top, then the barons and the knights and then the peasants. And it's very, very much to do with the idea of structure. But what we also need to say, and this is really important for medieval period, is above the king, we also have the concept of God and God's place in society. And we'll see that linked to their crime and their punishment as well. So again, structure, God at the top, then a king with divine right, Sundays being sacred, um, the, the consumption of alcohol being a, a problem is gonna be a consistent theme because it goes against, though it's part of celebration, it goes against the idea of keeping Sunday sacred. We've got the villages and towns very much separated. We've got people working very close next to each other. Um, and that's necessarily gonna cause arguments, particularly when you consider bottom section down here, the different weapons that they've got. And we've got potential for famines and wars to cause issue. And then we've got society being broken down into different problems, different times when that structure is attacked and that causes us issues. Types of crime in medieval time, well, the thing that stands out here is the high level of murder at 18.2%. It's, it's a high level there, whether we've got to remember this includes accidents, includes manslaughter, and includes suicide as well. Because of the nature of strip farming, where they're right next to each other with all those weapons, it means a fight can often break out, and because there's a lack of medical care, people often die of wounds. Hunger is a major issue because of the poor harvests. And as a result of that, particularly after the Black Death, we get vagrancy becoming a crime after 1351, as people travel from place to place, trying to get the better deal, trying to get more money, trying to survive. And at the same time, the hierarchy, the nobility, seeing it as something they feared, something that causes problems within their structured society. Crime of scolding is increasing an issue at this point. Um, because we've got poverty, outlaw, outlaw gangs become a problem. But a major focus here is on religious beliefs. And um, the idea that going against God, gambling, even shaving on Sunday, homosexuality, and the Lollards are particularly religious group trying to change the religious structure. These are all issues which are which become crimes. Now, 
the law is restructured out of 1351 um, to, to include treason. So high treason goes against the king, petty treason goes against the man of the house. But in, interestingly, the, to, part of the, the king's desire, the government's desire to make sure the coins stay pure is the counterfeiting coins also becomes treason and is punishable in the same way. So major change here. 1285, Edward the first passed the Statute of Windsor, Winchester, sets up a voluntary service. So we have sheriffs who are often worth the nobles working with coroners and chief constables in, in an area. We have a very much a local aspect to this. So an armed posse would be used to track down a, a, a criminal. Locally, we'd have chief constables of the hundred who'd serve for one year, and then more locally, you'd have the parish constables who would look to catch criminals and ensure all men provide armed service. And particularly, they'd enforce the idea that when a crime had been committed, there would be a hue and cry. And that would be an obligation for people to take part in this. So here we have, we have the crime committed, we have the initial response, and then we have the two different systems. So for lesser crimes, we have the manor and the court, um, or the borough court or the church court system. Um, later on, we got the JPs. And then we got the, for the more serious crimes, we got the court session or sizes. Um, and we've also got the JP courts after 1361. Interestingly, the juries would come from the accused local areas um, and would be, would be chosen because they know the defendant and would be able to give an informed view, which is very different to our local view that you wouldn't get someone who knew the defendant. And here we just have confirmation of those various different types of, of courts. So just as the peace become more important after 1361, uh, local gentry, the well educated, and they replaced the sheriff courts, uh, three to four per county, and after 1388. So we can see this developing as we go through a more developed system. Um, they hold the quarter sessions, which are held every four times, uh, four times per year. Manor courts are more the local crimes, the more non-serious crimes, um, passed to them by tithings or constables, individuals. And they, they start fading into the early modern. That's one change we're going to see between medieval and early modern. Towns have got the similar borough courts and have a town watch, so it's slightly different to, to the countryside. Church courts are try moral crimes and put priests on trial, um, often trying people for adultery as well. Um, and I, I did mention this earlier, juries selected from the accused homes areas often don't take longer than 20 minutes. Um, more than half of all judgments were not guilty, so people tend to define in favour of the accused. Punishments in the medieval period, whether it be fine, particularly for those who could afford them, for the rich people, um, particularly those who were involved in crimes against money in the first place, so traders or thieves or gamblers, and anyone who didn't take part, any villagers didn't, didn't take part in the hue and cry. We also have public humiliation. Uh, scolds would have the cock and stool, borough courts used stocks and pillory, so they'd embarrass people, they'd show them up in, in front of their society, as we can see happening here. Imprisonment, we, we did have prisons, but they're not generally used apart from debtors and forgers who couldn't afford to pay their fine. And you had to pay your jailer for all your goods, including your food or your bedding and so forth. So you, you'd have to be rich to be to be um, having a, a good time in prison. And of course, the very rich could afford that. Punishment for murder or burglary um, from 1275, rape and stealing goods for more than 12 days. That's more than the, the purchase of a sheep um, that would be involved hanging and we have to remember hanging at this point isn't an immediate it's not a quick death it's a slow death 80% um, of hangings were for non-violent crime like stealing if you committed high treason you go against the state and this is this is isn't a surprise thing as the state that's organized this you'd be hung drawn and quartered so hung until you're almost dead and then your insides would be would be uh, exposed, cut into and, and cut out of you, including your private parts potentially being burned in front of you, then you'd be chopped into four parts and you'd be displayed as a sign to stop other people. Heresy was a was a very serious crime because it goes against God um, and could lead to you being burned alive. Same true for petty treason because you're breaking down society. There are well ways to avoid punishment. You could join outlaws, although that obviously has a risk as you get caught because that itself is a crime. 
you could seek sanctuary and then abjure the, the, the state. So if you went to a church and stood that stayed there for a certain amount of days, got the bishop or the local priest to support you, you would be allowed to abjure the state. That means you'd have to leave, you'd have to leave the kingdom. Um, basically, medieval people were saying, we don't want you here, going to cause a problem in another, another country. You could seek benefit of the clergy, so you could say you were part of the clergy, for which you'd have to recite part of the Bible. If you were really rich, you could buy a pardon, pardon from the king, or you could join the army abroad and serve the king that way. So we're on to the early modern period. And the question here is, how far was this similar to the medieval period? Is it just more of the same? Well, we've got a couple of major changes that occurred during this period. The population of England changes uh, significantly doubling within 100 years. And go, going hand in hand with that is increased prices, falling wages on employment. So we can see there is going to be a lot of problems during this period. We also get some um, urbanisation during this period. More people move to towns, not as much as the industrial period, but 20% more living in towns than had done so by at the start of this period 20 percent more increased by 1750 and we get great wealth and great poverty existing side by side so gin lane projects, projects this this image down here of the very poorest of society desperately trying to survive um, one of those ways of surviving is by drinking which of course causes more issue itself roads are built communications improved um, that brings its own crime as we'll see very shortly Printing press means there's the further crime of, of, of going against the state, but also people are eager to find out about crime that's going around. By 1750, we've got four daily newspapers. The Tudor period sees more state control, but this is followed by the huge increase in unrest during the Civil War. And really important is one at the bottom, we get a change in terms of the religion, Puritans increasingly gain control and moral crimes are pursued. And that again has an issue, uh, as a knock on effect. Plus, as we get the debate swinging from one monarch to another, it becomes a crime to go against the monarch's religion. And that, of course, gives people a problem. So we have less violence between nobles during this period of time. And a new focus on new crimes, particularly coming from the mid 16th century. Um, and then we get a decrease from mid 17th century, and that's all to do with the increase in population, rising prices, and then that stabilizing. And you see that with these graphs here. So the, the, the issues, we get a spike, and then we get a relatively calming period. So not surprisingly, with the, the increasing population, we get food prices increasing, many roaming from city, from sorry, from village to village. Um, we got a combination of two issues here. We got the printing press um, publishing Thomas Harmon's book, which shows these images of these vagrants and the threat that they're causing. And that, of course, causes great greater concern amongst people. As we get increase with Puritans, we get these moral crimes increasing. Um, godly communities worried about drinking, swearing, gambling, sexual immorality. Major changes, specific crimes, much an increase in, in witchcraft. We don't know specific figures, but it's likely to be hundreds. And then from the 1700s, as we get an increased focus on science, that actually decreases. As the government tries to put import taxes on, we get people smuggling goods in, and we can have up to 50 people involved in that, each with a different job, whether it be getting the ship, whether it be bringing the cargo onto shore, whether it then getting it, hiding it and, and selling it on. And we have examples of people being murdered during this. And as travel increases and people track how their money with them, their valuables with them, we get highway robbery becoming an issue, particularly during the time of Elizabeth I. Traditionally, we've got this image of the gentleman highwayman, but that, that's far from the truth. They're mostly rough thugs and we've got some horrible uh, crimes committed and examples of, of roughing up and killing. Human cry does continue. The role of sheriff decreases and the major important thing is the role of the justice of the peace increases. The most serious crimes are now dealt with over six circuits with two judges dealing with the most serious crimes. Assizes held at different towns twice a year. The JP quarter sessions dealt with petty crimes, but JPs also deal with other local issues like fixing the wages, um, 
with road mending. Um, and by 1600, small groups of JPs met at petty sessions and the manorial courts now have lost their, their sway. Two year appointments of church wardens, constables and overseers of poor, often keep involved in families. They know the offenders and dealt with them. So we still got a huge role of community. Now, in terms of punishments during this period, um, we get an increase in, in shame and punishments like public penance or use of pillory, cucking, ducking stools, scolds, bridle, um, stocks, whipping, branding, all more widespread. Perhaps not surprisingly, where we got the, this more moral outlook with the rise of the Puritans. Prisons continue to be those who, who can pay fines. The Tudors regulate prisons with the 1531 Jail Act, um, allowing JPs to build prisons where necessary, but actually they were very underused. It wasn't a common punishment. On the other hand, we do get a change with the vagrant, uh, the vagrant bridewells. So these are houses of corrections where vagrants were forced to go, um, where they would be forced to work or physically punished. Uh, and the Vagrant Act of 1609 led to JPs building bridewells in every county. So it becomes more common as we've got this fear of these people wandering from place to place, again, as poverty increases. We've also got Again, not surprisingly, in the turmoil of the 17th, 16th and 17th century, the, the major political changes there with the Tudors and then the, the Civil War, more capital punishment, pe more people being hanged, drawn and courted. That, that links actually with the religious uh, attacks on people as well, because there is more chance of people trying uh, assassinations. A concern about the amount of executions or the amount of crimes occurring is reflected in the what's known as the bloody code. Um, this exists from 1688 to 1820. And what they basically did is they increased the amount of offences that could result in execution. So that goes up from 50 to 200 um, in 1820. So uh, a, a huge increase. Um, one exact, for example, includes the 1723 Black Act, which included poaching. Now, it's supposed to be deterrent. It's supposed to stop people from committing these crimes. But actually, because the, the punishment was so severe, uh, the judges and juries were less willing to pass sentence on minor offences and therefore the amount of executions actually decreased. And we now have a new type of punishment. We now get transportation, not to Australia yet, that happens later, but to North America and the West Indies, to the British colonies that existed there. Okay, here we have the industrial period, and this is likely to come up in most exam papers because it has such significance in terms of urbanization and the changes to the police. Okay, let's have a look, start off by having a look at society. So this period really is dominated by the industrial revolution, revolution and all that bring uh, the mines, the, the factories, the, the urbanization, railways being developed, but urbanization really is the key to this. And we look at these figures here, we've got a significant change here from only 6 million population um, in 1750 and then 21 million in 1850 and up to 37 million by 1900. So uh, an increase over that 150 year period by over six times. By 1850, totally new towns of Manchester, Birmingham, Bradford, Leeds had emerged. More people for the first time ever are living in urban rather than rural areas. Meanwhile, in these cities, the gap between the rich and the poor widened. Rich move out of the inner cities, poor moved into them in horrible squalid conditions, often sharing uh, courtyards and toilets, back to back houses. Same time, the British Empire grows to, to include Australia, and that's going to be important in a moment. Democracy becomes important, and we have this key change here in the Enlightenment, uh, which for human beings, really, have a, there's a move away from religion and more questioning what it actually means to be uh, human. And um, we've got Bentham there talking about the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And we'll see how true that, that bears out. Literacy increases during this time period, and that's linked to the 1870 Education Act, which means school is, is compulsory for under, twins, under tens. Many are addicted to alcohol in the slums. Um, leading to a temperance movement, that is to try to persuade people to stop using alcohol. But for many, alcohol is a way out of their misery. So we see a gradual increase in crime uh, to begin with in the 1750s, and then a sharp rise 
in the early 1800s, particularly after 1815, as soldiers return from the Napoleonic Wars. And then we see a fall again with the new police forces. So here we go, as the new police forces start coming in, they start to decrease. Most of the crimes of this period are crimes uh, to do with petty theft and they're opportunistic. Only 10% of the crimes are violent. Um, and even then, most people know they're murder victims. 75% of offenders are men, and they are very much linked to, in, in many ways towards the poverty. The inaccessible city areas, city centres are, are very difficult. The wages fall between 1815 and 1822 as soldiers return from the Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars. They can't find a job. And now with increased education, more, more people are scared by the idea of the criminal um, the criminal class almost um believed in these penny dreadful these stories that appear in these these cheap newspapers stories about criminals which terrify the middle classes now we have a fight back here in the enforcement a major change in enforcement here first of all the bow street runners uh and the magistrates of john fielding in in london 1754 it set up uh, basically a court which becomes similar to a police station However, his plans for this become a nationwide are rejected. He does also publish a magazine from 1775 onward, which looks to track the numbers and figures of crime. And the government is persuaded to support that with 400 quid put into it each year. However, the major change comes in 1829 with Sir Robert Peel and the Metropolitan Police. Based in London with 3000 people, two commissioners run it. Uh, they're deliberately dressed up to not look like soldiers. They've got the dark blue hats. They've got no weapons. Um, and this does spread throughout the country. However, if we look at the dates of these here, we, get, we have to be aware that these, this is a slow change. Change the towns from 1835. Then we've got the rural that so goes in the counties and the county and police, uh, borough police act. But, but it's slow, but it's steady and it's important and it does make a difference to crime. Now, for the first time, probably, uh, we, we got streets being patrolled and actually crime looking to be prevented rather than just chased up. Um, and it's li likely that the police were responsible for the drop in crime rate after 1850. So they remove prostitutes, they remove vagrants and drunks, they stop illegal drinking and gambling. And then we then have a step up in the pace of detecting crime. The detectives introduced to the Met in 1842. 1880s we've got 800 working in the CID the criminal investigation department they use photographs and from 1897 they use fingerprints few changes in the court system actually um, still being tried in the sizes and courts at quarter sessions but from now on we've got lawyers representing both sides so we've got the basis of our modern court system now hanging recent changes in hanging here so hanging had been taking place on, on hanging days, really f famous days where people would gather, flat prison roofs, people would go out to watch them. We've got changes now with the 1866 scene, the new drop, and then 1874, the long drop, which changed from being a slow strangulation to an immediate death. However, with the Enlightenment, few executions occur uh, from the beginning of the 19th century. So 1871, 1800 to 1809, that drops uh, by almost a third, um, 1830 to 1839. Uh, it also means that we remove letter stealing, arson and other issues as capital offences. But with that, we get the move towards prisons and prisons become a lot harsher with a little. There's a little period of time where flogging is dropped and then it's brought right back. And 1865 Prisons Act deliberately tries to make food monotonous. We have plank beds replacing hammocks to make it more uncomfortable and the amount of pointless work. So we have people on a treadmill on this picture here and you know, it, it, it's a it's an unpleasant, it's deliberately unpleasant experience prison. We have a new move here towards transportation. Uh, 160,000 convicts are transported, with the peak being in 1830, uh, around 5,000 uh, per year in that period. There, most of the people sent um, on on these transports had stolen food or low value items. Young age, they're only 26. They would go for seven years or 14 years or, or lifetime. Punishments would see the, them hit um, with lashes. And even when their time period finished, few could afford to return home. By the 1830s, there's a real debate going on. Some people see it as too, too harsh. Some people see it as too soft. 
Um, and some people just say you just shouldn't be sending convicts to the colony. What chances it got of surviving? Um, so from 1840s, there are fewer being transported and it's ended in 1868. Of course, that puts the pressure back on prisons. We have a move now to reform prisons under Sir John Howard. The Discharge Prison Act uh, bolluses discharge fees, so you don't have to pay to get out of prison anymore. And he tries to improve the health of prisons with the Health of Prisoners Act. Prisons are, prisons are cleaned. And his book on how prisons should be dealt with um, the state of prisons influenced the idea of separate separation for sick prisoners, bringing in adequate food and living jailers who could look after the prisoners. Elizabeth Fry is another reformer who focuses on Newgate women's prison. She encouraged them to read the Bible, divides them into 12 and they're overseen. So it's some sort of rehabilitation. However, this doesn't last forever because the 1811 um, after 1811, the Millbank Penitentiary, which had been a reforming prison, a disaster and is closed down. Um, from 1823, Jail Act, the Jail Act looked for JP to regulate and check on prisons with regular visits by governors and by surgeons, although that's not always carried out. There weren't any official inspectors until 1835. Now, the decline of the transportation leads to a further 50 prisons opening, and by 1877, we have 90 prisons. Um, and the treatment really of prisoners, as we can see in this drawing, is it goes back to being very harsh with separate, so they're separated, and then the silent treatments, so they're not allowed to talk at all. And we get increased pointless work, such as the crank and the treadmill. And now we reach our final period, the, the modern era. And the question here is, are we actually doing anything right? Are we going in the right direction? Are we doing things in a positive way? Can we see hope for the future? Let's have a look, first of all, how the population changed during this period. So increasingly, we got uh, urbanisation. Uh, scary statistic, really. By 2011, 80% of people lived in cities or large towns. We've got a change in the amount of money. Um, we've seen this as an issue throughout the years. So there was an economic struggle in the early 1900s and then after World War II. However, but after 1957, uh, Harold Wilson was able to say that people would never had it so good. By 2000, many people owned luxury homes and, 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 and cars, but but the credit card and, and debt ha, has taken over. So people are spending, but they don't necessarily have the means to pay that back. By 1880s, mo most working men have got the vote, and by 1920, all women have got it. We got the set up the liberal state, and then we got the issue that comes with that, which is many people worrying that the, that the existence of the welfare state means that we're spending too much money, and we got a backlash over that as well. Science and technology have totally changed, particularly the way that enforcement is. Uh, we've got whole new crimes uh, linked to drugs and to cars and to music and to pirating on the internet. We've also got an awful lot of people coming to, to our shores, um, often bringing their own set of resent. Uh, in 1900, we've got Russian Jews, then we've got Commonwealth migration. Uh, the EU has brought migration, uh, immigration as well, and all of these have brought social tensions. The very makeup of though Britain has changed. Uh, increasingly, jobs have been done by machines. That means that people are likely to be either unskilled or unemployed. Women have got more rights. The church has lost control largely. No longer has the grip on the population it used to have. So only 10% of people saw themselves as church go by the year 2000. More divorces, more single parents. Um, but alongside that, changes in the way that we see individual rights. So the 1948 Declaration on Human Rights means that we shouldn't be discriminating on, on any, any of those instances. That has an issue for crimes, but also has an, an issue for punishment as well. 1900 to 1955 crime rates continued pretty much as they had done before. However, during the Blitz, we get a significant increase in crime, a little blip of crime just there, and crime then has really shot up in the years after that, partly because of our classification of crimes has changed. Now, chain crimes themselves have changed, so some crimes now are not reported, um, so smacking, although it exists as a crime, so some are no longer crimes like as abortion or suicide or homosexual acts, and we have new crimes such as smoking or not wearing a seatbelt. Now, car crime has really changed a lot of this. It's also changed the way the police are seen as well, because we've got brand new laws. Um, you can see how it changes, breathalysers in 1967. 
seat belts a little bit further back. Speed cameras came in in 1992. Or, and actually, having said that, road deaths have fallen steadily since the 1960s. Better locks lead to less joyriding of late and stealing and respraying. So that's been a drop in some crimes, but equally, um, it's changed the way that people perceive uh, crime full stop. Awful period of the 1970s and 80s, uh, probably peaking with the high saw stadium disaster in 1984 in terms of football hooliganism, um, 39 dying there. We got CCTV coming in, increased prices means it, it's, it's the, actually the, the hooliganism is less likely to happen in the stadium, more likely to happen elsewhere. We have had a massive increase in the amount of race crime though, um, particularly as immigration from Commonwealth and that's led to race relation acts being passed in 60s and 70s to ensure equal access. Hate and race crime has become much more of an issue. It began really with, with the killing of Altab Ali, um, but, but the turning point was the 1993 murder of Stephen Lawrence. In 2005, you could be tried for the same evidence if there was the same crime, if there was new evidence available as a result of this. And we have the new category of hate crime with severe sentences with new laws coming in 1998 and 2003. There are crimes linked to drugs, um, often linked to music itself, and that increased from the 1960s. We've had a sweeping ban and then a categorization of different drugs from 1971. Huge profits being made by organized gangs from smuggling, and that's linked to prostitution as well. And we have legal high still a problem today. Internet, of course, has changed the world um, and it's led to a whole new set of, 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 of cyber crimes. Um, pirating issues, phishing scams, hacking into accounts, extortion. Um, cyber crime was only included in crime rates in 2015 and doubled the rate of crime from the previous year. So a whole new set of crimes to consider. The police, in terms of enforcement, the police have really gone a, a major change. So uh, it, up after the, the introduction of the Met, police spread. Um, we, so we could say that that reached the golden age by the 1950s, 1960s. For a number of different reasons, trust in the police has dropped from 1917 onwards. Uh, 2005, only less than two thirds of the population said they trust the police. That's partly because officers now are a lot more likely to be in cars rather than on, on foot. Uh, many people resent the police because of traffic offences. We've got examples of the police misusing their power, such as against the mines in the 1980s, and examples of police corruption, such as the interference and the dishonesty that involved um, the, the Hillsborough Stadium disaster in, from 1989. So people lost faith. Police over this time have really been reorganised. 200 forces were in existence in 1900. There were only 43 after the 1964 Act of Parliament. Officers now require a higher standard of education. There are more women involved in the police, but we still have an issue. There are only 4% of ethnic minorities in the police. We've gone back a little bit full circle, really, with medieval period, with neighbourhood watch being an issue. We still got no weapons um, as a standard policeman, but we do have taser and pepper spray. And a lot of police, uh, the image of the police is tarnished by the issue of paperwork getting in the way of, some would argue, solving crime. Technology has played a massive change in the way that policing can be done um, from establishing and identifying blood groups, uh, use of fingerprints, you being used in court from 1902, massive change with the use of DNA from 1984. We have communication improved with telephone boxes in London from 1929 and then portable radios, use of CCTV. Um, and in 2015 alone, we had over 700,000 requests, monitor emails and texts. Courts have changed. So we now have the Courts Act in 1971 replaced the old system. Finally, they're sized in the quarter sessions of the new Crown Court in 90 different locations. Our judges still hear the most serious and magistrates hear the less serious crimes. There has been changes within that, though. So uh, it means that our juries now are more representative because you don't have to have a certain amount of property to qualify. We have juvenile court specialising young people from 1908. Um, we have women more involved, so the first magistrates in 19 to 1920, and today actually women outnumber men in terms of being magistrates. 
on to punishment then. So we've had debate uh, as has really changed over the this period of time. So corporal punishment, um, even some mi liberals supported these of the birch, but it was campaigned against and its use ended for young offenders in 1933 and for all offenders in 1948. And it ended even as a something to be used in prison as a punishment in 1962. Massive problem here. Uh, must have debate rather here over the issue of capital punishment. So the last criminals were executed in 1964 and the 19, 1965 we see the abolition of the Death Penalty Act. There's still arguments continue with people saying it should be brought back but most uh, uh, MPs oppose its use. Um, there's been petitions for both sides and debates on both sides. Um, there's more, slightly more people wanting it to main, be kept as abolished. Um, some people they want to call it back, but MPs f largely favour the abolishment of the death penalty, the continued abolishment. We got a change in the way the young people are, are, are dealt with, so youth prisons. Um, from 1902, we got borstals and then young offenders institutions. Um, now, these days, 10 to 70 years receive support and secure children's home um, and the change of age of responsibility from 1908, the age of responsibility was seven years old, and now it's 10 years old. We have a continued debate over this year of, of rehabilitation. It's, it's changed over the time period. So 1900s, 1970, there was a real move towards rehabilitation, um, but it's been mixed ever since. So 1896, we had separate treatment for mentally ill prisoners, prisoners. treadmills were abolished. We had a major reform in terms of re rehabilitation. Um, Silent and treatment has ended from 1922, and the end did also the, the shaving of heads, um, that, that there is there would be normal work and small pay. Uh, uh, and then there was a debate on recognition that not everyone could be rehabilitated, and therefore years could actually be added to your sentences. Major issue though involves the issue of rising prison populations. Um, many people want tougher sentences, but that has consequences. So many people even are awaiting trial, are, are kept in prison. So 1990 strange ways in Manchester saw riots, and more locally, there were two people died during that, more locally in 2009 there were riots in Shrewsbury Prison, which had been built for 177 prisons, but in that year had 316 prisoners. We have building of new prisons over the last, well from 1985 to 2006, um, since 1992, more and more so prisons have been given to the hands of of private companies um, to say try and save some money. Prisons continue to cost an awful lot of money, with the annual cost of prison being put at twenty-seven thousand pounds in 2007. Finally, there are now alternatives to prison, which has developed over this time period. So, in 1907, we had the probation service which gave support for those who came out of, of prison early, um, monitored them, made sure they were doing the right things. In 1967, we had the parole system for uh, early leaving. In 1990s, we had some prisoners wearing digital tags so they could be monitored that way. And from 1972, the community service order meant that prisoners, rather than go to prison, rather criminals, rather than go to prison, could do unpaid or educational service, something that would benefit the society. In 1990, we also had a focus on looking after the, the victims themselves. So the Victim Support Charter, later called the Victim Support Code, established the treatment for a victim. And that meant that a victim could give a, a support statement in court, either read by themselves or by a representative, to the criminal to express their effect on it. So it was a way of trying to even up the, the issue and try to explain the effects on the criminal that that had had. And we'll just finish up now but with a final look at the assessment. The paper starts off with some simple uh, simple knowledge questions, content questions, just one word answers are doing fine for them. And then it's really, really important that you plan your answers. Question two, write a clear and organised summary. It must be paragraphed, it must be planned first, you need to think about what it is and you need to plan the different concepts you're going to cover. Question three, what caused the increase of crime is the example given here. Uh, again, you need to plan that question, plan your answer, make sure you are considering different factors. And second order concept, again, that just means complexity. You're thinking about 
how it changed over time, prioritizing those different issues or linking those different issues together or thinking about how it affected different aspects of society. And then we have an essay question here at the bottom. The major points are one here. So again, pick which question you're going to do very carefully. Again, plan your answer and same sort of thing. We're going to look for a very short introduction, giving you a direction, a paragraph agreeing or giving one factor, a second paragraph, and then a sophisticated conclusion we're looking for, showing us it's not as simple as yes or no, or this or that.